I remember looking around, man. Like, I don't know what it was, bro. It was just on me, man. I was like, man, some of us not coming back. And I never thought it was me. I never thought that I was one of them. I knew I was ready to be one of them. I had already made my mind up for that. A Marine Corps recruiter comes to the projects I lived in on the west side of Fort Worth. And as my baby sister is sitting around, hugging me around my waist, and uh, we just kind of walk, talking to him through the door. And uh, he said, you want to set a better example for the young lady that's hugged you around your waist? You'll come see me downtown. Kind of looked at my life for what it was and where I was at and, you know, still cracking the streets and my family's still hungry and everybody's still kind of doing the same thing with the same excuses. So I go downtown. April 22nd, 2000, I arrive at Bravo Company 1-8. And uh, we, we get met by Sergeant Bobby Smith. Skinny, country white boy, big mustache, looking us in the face, telling us how badass Bravo Company 1-8 is with machine guns. Uh, we're the best in the battalion. We work hard, but we play hard. We look out for each other, giving us this whole code. And we train hard. I'm talking about some stuff that I never thought a person like me would be doing, you know. Uh, Zodiac in freaking middle of December while people get hypothermia and all this kind of stuff and we was just crazy and I think the fact that the guy take all that stuff that I experienced in my childhood all of the all of that that came with that and put me in an environment to where it was okay to be angry and they taught me how to use that and then I understood what it is to be a brother. When these guys come back from training, we're going to go on pre-deployment leave. They're going to come back and do all of the red stuff and we're going to deploy. These guys are not going to have any any real field ops. Uh, they coming straight out of SOI and going straight to Fallujah. And it didn't sit right with me, man. So I decided to stay in and we went to Fallujah. I got, I got extended for that deployment. So that was my third deployment. I had knowledge of Fallujah before we got there. I was always hoping that was never gonna happen. And Marines always talking about, I can't wait to get some, go go fuck these guys up, and this, that, and that, and all this just insensitive stuff. And I, I didn't wanna hear it. And Anderson was like, hey, so I'm gonna tell you, like, you kinda act like a bitch, bro. Man, let, let's go outside, Anderson. We go out there, man. I said, man, you understand that some of us not coming home. We're ready for this fight, but still some of us are not coming home. So I don't want to hear it because it just reminds me of somebody's not coming home. Can you and I be good with that? He's dead in my bag. He dapped me up and gave me some love. And now he's not here anymore. We leave Camp Fallujah. We stage outside of the city of Fallujah. Like nobody's panicking, nobody's stressing. Nobody was even really praying. It was just kind of, just around. And you know, I don't want to shake the tree and kind of ask everybody how they're doing or whatever, because I don't really kind of want it to be where they are. I think the zone, the, the kind of, I don't know if it's zen or whatever you call it, but the, the aura of everybody was, it was ready. And as we get to the city, we get out of the, get out of the Amtraks. I just remember seeing all these explosions, man purple and green sparks and pink and red flames all in the midst of the city. And as we're making it into the city, like actually crossing the street, getting out of out of dirt and getting onto ground, concrete, um, we get ready to make entry to our first building. I still don't really process that this is real life shit. This is really happening. Uh, these, these Machine guns is going off, it's not simonition. Like it's real gunfire. These explosions that are happening, these buildings are really crumbling. And we're going to our first objective, like our holding ground, until we get to, get to go and we move to, the, I think it's the cultural center. And we moved there under the cover of darkness. And it was like, man, as soon as the sun came up, it was like the whistle said, go. And that was our first experience of actually having to engage the enemy. But like I said, in the phone, the rabbit got it. Shortly after that, you know, Wells, Jimenez, and Gunner Sergeant Shane, they got hit trying to cross, come across the street from the cultural center, got hit by a sniper. I mean, remember, as we was on top of the building, 
and we were shooting at the area where we thought the sniper was at. We didn't really have a positive ID. We were just trying to suppress the area to, you know, lighten the load on where these guys were getting hit at. And we start moving to our next checkpoint. This was supposed to, I don't remember this because it's where everything happened. Phase line grace. Well, I hear Anderson come over the radio. Hey, sir, I think we got Iraqi Special Forces ahead. Iraqi Special Forces are gonna be chaperoned by the army. If they're not with the army, deem them as enemy. I immediately, open fire, open fire, open fire. Everybody looking at me like, hey, motherfucker, scream, open fire, open fire, open fire. Hey, Rose, take a machine gun, get this avenue of approach. Hey, Carver, take a machine gun, go get it, go get in the overwatch position. And I take off running. And I'm still screaming, open fire, open fire. And by the time I'm almost there, fire opens. Uh, unfortunately, it's not from us. And I get there, we're like, hey man, what's going on? He's like, I think we got three of them hit. Uh, I think Anderson may be dead. And I tell him, I said, man, I'll go get them just to let me die. And he said, we don't have tank support for like 45 minutes. You cannot get hit. We won't have close air support, we won't have anything. I said, okay, just let me die. I take all this gear off. Like I said, I made my mind up. And I run across the alleyway. And they see me. I know they see me. Boom, 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 boom. I'm talking about they on me. When there's a breaking fire, I jump up and I, I go. And I jump over this porch. All the Marines that I see, they have Anderson's face. That's who I see. And then as I'm wiping it off, now I'm able to orient and I see who these are. I don't know, I don't know who the other Marines in the, in the hole with him were, but I just land on, hey, who's hit, who's hit? And Russell's like, I'm hit, I'm hit. So I was able to get Russell up. But the fire wasn't accurate enough because as I'm running across this alleyway, I remember burst of fire hitting in front of my feet. Boom, 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 boom. Then behind me, boom, 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 boom. And it starts to get closer and closer. I remember saying, man, they're bragging at me. And as I remember having that thought, I fall in a pile. And both of us had bursts of ammunition hit in front of us, skip our bodies, hit on the other side of us. And I run up and I get him. And this time I kind of got him in like the, the just got married carry or whatever. And I get him to the CCP. So this time I come out, bullets hitting all around me and stuff, like concrete flying, dirt flying, and some of the shrubs around me caught on fire. And I remember just head being in the dirt, man, just keep on going. That's all I kept doing, I didn't see anything. And I accidentally run into this porch with my Kevlar and I fill up top and it was a porch. And I jump over and it was dominant. And got him on my shoulder, ran him back, got him to the casualty collection. And we had, uh, I think it was Lewis and Naderman were our core men. Those guys were miracles, man. God was in those men's hands. And I come back out, I need to find Anderson. Like, I'm convicted, I gotta find Anderson. I go down, what happens? I gotta find Anderson. So as I come out now, we got tank support. And we get Anderson out, you know, get all the gear stuff off, call in the medevac and everything, and they get him out of there. I think the hardest part about that fight was, we were defeated, man. Like, Marines were broken. Like, the, the, the cries from our brothers, that was the hardest part about that fight. Some words that haunt me is Nas was screaming at his Marines, stop making all that, and then you hear two explosions go off. The enemy had tunnels under the city. So as they were making entry, they throw two grenades, the grenades go off, they jump in the ground and run under the city. I immediately make entry, white light come in and see a shadow running under the ground. And Knopfler, uh received like the full blow of a grenade to his face. And after that, you know, we finally get to the school. At the school, we use the school as an operating base. House to house, street to street. I'm not proud of that fight, but I'm proud of the legacy. Uh, and we did that. There wasn't a house untouched by Bravo. We got to Alisa June 22nd, 2004, and we made it back to Camp Lejeune, February 1st, 2005. When we got back, man, I struggled so bad, man. Uh, but it's one of those things, like, man, I've been through some stuff before. I'll be all right, I can figure it out. Give me a little time. But this was different. 
it was like I was having a physiological response every day. Like my body was responding to gunshots and IEDs and bloodshed and Marines crying and all the other stuff that comes with that every day. And I got back, I finally had the ankle surgery and it gave me some time, but it didn't really help me because I was with my family who didn't understand. I wanted to go back on deployment and they wouldn't let me go back. I get the MCRD, Paris Island, become a Marine Corps drill instructor. Um, and I'm doing really well. But I was struggling. I literally went 12 years, man, with give or take two to four hours of sleep each night. And some of the nights when I do actually get what a good quality of sleep would feel like for me at that time, it's like your body's in a trance. Like, I get forced to watch a movie that I don't want to watch every night. Uh, you ever like sleep wrong and maybe a part of your body is numb, my whole body would feel like that, man. Until I get around all those crews. I start yelling and doing my whole drill structure thing or whatever. Yeah, I can zone out, I can focus and my body wouldn't be in that trance. But as soon as I get quiet time to myself, day, day, and it's like, I'm here we go with this shit again. I was glad I wasn't dead, but I was still not glad to be alive either, if that make any sense. I kind of just like, I'm just stuck in the middle, man. But all the therapy and all the stuff that came with that, with the Zoloft and the Trazodone, all the crazy pills that got you taken, it, 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 it gives you a fight plan to cope, but not one to live. You don't live. You just wake up and avoid. So unintentionally, you find yourself being a recluse, you know? But all that therapy, when you go through therapy, you find yourself in transition. So I gotta process all this information and get my life information so I can be a better version of myself. But you can't do none of that without God. And I said that, I stand tall on that in front of anybody, man. And I made it myself an option. I'm only gonna be a good person. I'm gonna make my mistakes. I'm gonna lick my wounds. It is what it is, but I'm only gonna be a good person. And in doing so, now I have an opportunity to be able to show and prove and be a model of God's blessing, love, glory, and grace, man. To, hey man, look, this is where you at. But you have no idea where you can go. You have no idea where you can go. And who's going to argue with me? And to have the opportunity to serve in this capacity, man, PTSD is not even a thing now. Um, like, I think about it every day, but as far as, like, responding to it or it, it having a, a grasp on me, uh, it's, I, I partner with PTSD now. We both go out and serve the world. I think Fallujah tells a story bigger than Fallujah. I think the story of us in that fight and what it takes to endure that kind of trauma and that kind of hardship, if you will, is the same thing it takes for this country to be as great as we claim to be. You don't. I don't care how good you are at acquiring your sights and squeezing the trigger on the enemy. You can't go and do the things that Bravo Company 1-8 did without being a band of brothers, without loving each other, without making it about each other more than yourself. I wouldn't wish for loser on anybody, um, especially when you think about the outcome versus the, versus the risk. But I also don't think there's anybody else that can do what we did. That's not even a beat on the chest. That's just standing tall in your assignment. No God called us for a reason. 